Uh, welcome to Design and Dialogue. I'm really excited to have with me today um, some old friends. <laughs> uh, Billy Sien and Todd Williams, architects here in New York, of course. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome them to, to Design and Dialogue. Hi, Todd and Billy. How are you? Hey, Stephen. <laughs> All right. All right, hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Um, of course, we know, uh, and I know personally, um, all of your, or a lot of your great projects, and, and I visited the studio and uh, spent some time with you. Um, but I was really happy to discover a small documentary, very short document, documentary film on your website recently um, that uh, I encourage everyone to have a look at. Uh, after this talk. Um, some words that come to mind about your practice, which I'm actually borrowing from your team in the studio, <laughs> are craft, uh, permanence, grace, porosity, nonlinear, grounded, family, genius, and insane. <laughs> Genius is You know, on those TikToks where they go like. Right. <laughs> I broke my fucking nose. Jesus. Domestic violence. Jesus Christ. This, this. Yeah, insane. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've got a broken fucking nose. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, um, okay, so so anyway, I just I just bring those up because those are some I think uh, really interesting starting points to kind of enter into the work and and some uh, references I think that we should sort of consider as we as we go through and have a look. Uh, but of course, um, you've been practicing for quite a while. While Billy and I met when I was in college, and you came to speak at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, that talk really made an impression on me. And so I had to approach you after the talk and, and we've been talking ever since. So <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here this morning and, and to, to talk in a more, um, well, I don't wanna say professional way because, <laughs> but, but you know, to hear from you um, about your arc and about um, where you're headed. So let's, um, Shall we begin the slides and maybe we can, we can start to understand uh, a little bit about your origin story. Great. Um, so I'm gonna take a screen. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the, the meeting Billy first. Uh, Billy was out there, and we, I can't even, I don't know how many years ago, but I do, I was aware that immediately stuck up, struck up a friendship and that was a very, very nice thing. Yeah. It was a great deal of joy and I think uh, made a connection to New York when you were out in the boonies, I guess, or once. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, Illinois. Chicago. Chicago, okay. <laughs> Chicago's not the boonies. <laughs> yeah, I come from I come from Midwest, so That's I like cool. that area. So um, one of the things you talked about when we talked before um, this discussion was a, a little, you said origin story. So we're actually going to talk about some things that happened and that we did in the beginning of our work and how that um, continues to feed us or teach us um, or lead us. Well, this shows the, the overlapping of hands. Uh, my hand upside down, Billy's right side up. Um, and we've drawn this, this mixture because we believe that the work comes from two hands and from many hands. Always many hands. Uh, of course, you've seen other people do this kind of thing, but uh, the scale difference is very, very interesting. That image is um, is somehow very romantic as well. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, so um, when when we talk about your origin story, I guess what uh, my first question would have to be is, how did you come to be partners at uh, Todd Williams, Billy Sin, architects, and funny, funny you ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Professionally and in life, I suppose. <laughs> so this next image is, of course, locating Carnegie Hall. And when I finished architecture school knowing nothing, um, one of my teachers said, you should go see Todd Williams. Um, he's in Carnegie Hall. And so I had a, I had a yeah. partner at that time, but we were beginning to 
separate. His name was Stephen Potters and uh, Billy came up to the studio. Just, I, I don't remember you had an appointment, but anyway. Uh, we I were, think I needed an appointment. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> there was no point for an appointment. Um, but I had uh, lived in Carnegie Hall for about five or six years. Actually, that arrow should point to the level above that, uh, the one just below the cornice, because it's after tiny. the first studio I had in 10, 1005, which was lower down in the building, I moved in there because people could live and work in the building, and they did. And many, many studios were, were 160, to be exact, uh, packed in around the main, main hall. Uh, because uh, Carnegie believed that the main hall needed the support of artists and their income. So it was a really very mixed um, and interesting building with um, people who were in the sort of more traditional things that you imagine Carnegie Hall sort of supporting. So there were um, certainly musicians, there were bow makers and um, also ballet classes, also people auditioning. Um, and this is an image that was taken by Joseph Astor, who is a photographer and filmmaker of Don Shirley, who was the top, the subject for the film, The Green Book. The Green Book doesn't begin to do justice to the, the, the elaboration of Don's uh, apartment, which was three floors below us. Uh, so clearly it was a, an interesting and crazy building. Can you give us the year this might have been? Uh, well, I moved in in 1973, and Billy came to work for me in 78. Yeah. Um, so I was, it was still a, a young practice. Um, I, had, I had been practicing. This was our, our floor. We had the very top floor of the building, um, and we climbed up the, the stairs. Uh, the elevator stopped a, a level below. We climbed up a metal fire stair and then entered the building. And when I first moved in, I shared it with a partner and a model maker. Uh, mm -hmm. They left, and uh, this is us just days before we left the apartment in 2008. So well, we got evicted. Everybody yeah. got evicted. So right. from uh, from basically when I met Billy, uh, well, I think we didn't we didn't really move in right away. No, no, no not at all. That was inappropriate. <laughs> um, but w within a couple of years, I would say by by 1980, we were living together, and then we stayed there to 2008. So. So yes, moved, that's 28 years. Yeah, we moved our studio. We um, ended up living here. This is a very odd picture, but that was the only room that our son had. So as we were getting evicted, he came back to sort of pose, pose in, his in, room. In, in what was his room, otherwise known <clears throat> as a closet. A nook. <laughs> no. It was three, it was four by four by uh, six, six and a half feet long. This is what you do in New York. This is what you do to your children. Yeah. Such a different New York, I can yeah. say. Uh, we, uh, Billy and I climbed up a rung ladder that I put in there that came from access to subways every single day to go to sleep. And our bed, literally, there was no railing to it. Uh, we slept in this, uh, in this bed underneath the skylight. It was amazing. Oh, it's beautiful. And so that was 28 years of uh, a bliss. Yeah. <laughs> it was, truly. I, I no, would never... Great. I never okay. wanted to leave. Sleeping under a skylight, I always felt kind of like Heidi. I don't know why Heidi. I guess I was high up. And yeah. Cold. yeah okay. uh, we've always collected things and love things, and some of them are ordinary. Many of them are ordinary. A couple of things on the right are from our son, uh, who became a designer and is a, you know, a younger colleague of, uh, of Stephen. And yeah. His, his partner, Chen Chen. Um, of course. And you also have, I mean, I noticed you have a, a fairly extensive art collection. I think we I do. saw Chuck Close and an Ellen Atsui amongst yeah. your yeah. yeah, one interesting that Ellen Atsui came from his very first trip to New York and he brought that over in a suitcase and uh, showed both at a gallery and also at an architect's home. We got that from the architect. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so this next project, Domestic yeah. Arrangements at the Walker Art Center, I believe I saw this in person when I was in college. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I want to tell you, um, somewhere here in my library, I have the, there was a small pamphlet, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and yeah. This, this project in particular, um, as we go through it, 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 it had 
uh, quite an, an impact on me because it was, it was architecture, but it was <laughs> architecture at the interior scale. Yeah. And, and, and it, re it spoke to me how you managed to, to wed um, the, there was, there was something very Asian inspired, right? Uh, and this kind of multifunctional set of surfaces and then something very uh, modernist at the same time. So. Yeah, thank you, Stevie. Well, that's, that was, this was a wonderful thing done by Mickey Friedman, who was married to Martin Friedman, the director of the Walker, and asked a number of architects to do installations there. It was very, very important in our lives. We had largely done into work and uh, we, this is a chance to think about the relationship of uh, experimenting with materials um, and uh, us imagining that we might one day create a home for ourselves. Well, how you want to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the materials were homosote, which are the walls that you see in the background, um, an expanded foam, which we use to cast the um, roof pieces, um, sauna tube cardboard, and then pallets, uh, moving pallets, which we filled with gravel and resin. And then this very long table, which I realize is an aspect of furniture that we continue to have wherever we go. We love really, really long tables. So you can leave a mess at one end and eat at the other. <laughs> this as it traveled was reassembled. Uh, so the homosote was material really we'd learned about actually from students making models. And uh, of course it was recycled newsprint uh, in, from uh, Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, we got a, a stack of it six feet tall and we, we intellectually figured out how much we could mine from a stack of homosote. And so this, these dimensions represent the depth of a, of a table saw, the eight inch table mm -hmm. saw with, from which these were cut. Very, they all then repacked. Very, Back, very dusty. Well, this I have one right very behind dusty. it. I know, I know, but very dusty to work on. Yeah, um, I have. To, I have to have one of those chairs if they still exist. Um, <laughs> well, we um, have that, both that green striped carpet here where we are right now and, a, and one of these chairs, although they, they don't look as pristine. So what's interesting here for me is that you're using these kind of industrial materials, um, which are, are common to uh, in architecture in a sense, right? Um, but, but reinventing them. And so there is a certain grace in your use of these long planks to, to develop a table, which is also, there's a suggestion of a bed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the, uh, the kind of, uh, I guess, the economy of, of means at work here in terms of the, the homosote becoming both uh, partition and furniture. Mm -hmm. um, well, and obviously, the, most of these things don't really work out. But I think, um, and even in our lives today, things don't work out, but I do think uh, we can continue to grow every time we try one of these. And so uh, it's one of the joyous periods to learn about expanded foam, which is not necessarily a healthy thing for the environment. Uh, we put the sauna tubes in to reinforce them, but in fact, they were often used for the blanks of surfboards in those days. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, um I was talking with um, some students and they were saying, well, how do you determine what materials you use? And I, and I said, it's really about just looking and seeing. So it's not anything that's ever predetermined, but we were in California and we went to see this guy making surfboards. So, But, but you know, it also things. has to do with people in the studio. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This, for example, uh, we often give in a small project like this, this is over to another assistant, uh, in the studio, it was Annie Chu that worked so much on this. She is and an Rick architect Gooding. and Rick Gooding, but really Annie at that time. Um, They're both architects out in California. Uh, this was a collaboration, of what, another project we absolutely loved and I wish we could do more. But again, it was both a success and the kind of perhaps, you know, a, more an experiment than a, than a victory. So Elisa Monte um, is a choreographer and she has a dance company. And um, she asked us to work on the costumes and the sets. She was out of a uh, Martha Graham. Right. And uh, so this, our, our idea that the world, the, the, the concept was a, a, Bren, a Glenn Branca score and the score was called The World Upside Down, I believe it was. Yeah. A very, very uh, powerful 
pounding pounding uh, score, which was probably much too long for any dance. This uh, we had the idea that the that the set would actually be continuously movable and an object that would be both a background and a foreground. And then we designed the costumes, which were less successful than they look at this image, but uh, were, were something that could become both male and female. Well, and also up and down, yeah. so it's a little literal. Can we stay on that image for just a second? Sorry, Billy. Uh, I saw, uh, Backwards. Sorry. <laughs> Go back. I just wanted to talk a little bit about your process um, and, and the way that in this project, for example, you're, you're thinking at, at multiple scales. Um, and so there's the sketch, which it feels to me almost as if um, it's imagining an architecture in an open space. Like, I don't get the sense that that, even though there's a, there's a, there's a kind of uh, amphitheater, it feels more expansive than that. It feels almost like it could be outdoor. So yeah, no, that's correct. We I think that that's a probably a conceit that 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 these things can be both indoor and outdoor, and that they can relate to different scales. Mm -hmm. um, that, by the way, that that came from the idea of a book. Let's say a book like this that can be hinged and turned inside out, and the uh, the piano hinge or the edge of the the binding uh, is very, very sturdy, and that enables uh, something, and I would show this, that this could actually be cantilevered further out than, uh, than the one third that one thinks. So in fact, it could cantilever two thirds out, and our idea was to break the proscenium and to engage the audience. So clearly there was an ambition here, uh, and I think it was actually an ambition that was too strong for it was overwhelming and, and uh, I think it was inappropriate to the dance. I One mean, of the things that I want to discuss as we go through your work is not so much about um, the kind of simplification of, of who does what, but, but more the, the, the more complex description that you've shared with me, which is about um, who, how, how each of you contributes to the collaborative studio practice. Mm -hmm. And so, this image of the of of the architectural space um, on the left feels uh, very um, classical in a sense, right? And it, it and I'm I'm making the assumption that that's your sketch, Todd. Yes. While the image on the right uh, feels more, um, I guess, about the movement, about the body, about the the poetry, about the the I can imagine the. Uh, the fabric, um, the fashion, and I'm, I'm wondering, Billy, is that, is that your, your... It must be me. No, no, it's clearly, <laughs> it's clearly it's so, 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 I mean, I think, you know, as we think about your partnership, um, it would be nice to hear uh, how each of you makes a contribution, uh, not to the individual projects per se, I'm just using this as an example, but, mm -hmm. but to the practice at large and how that collaboration with the whole studio then sort of um, expands upon your ideas. Yeah. Well, I do believe that um, this, is a, this is a construction of that screen uh, later um, in, in actually in Amsterdam and then the screen with a, with a uh, I'm sorry, what you, a scrim that's been put on it. So it could be illuminated from the back or the front and you, the dancers could dance on the frame or in, in the front and the back or have it together. Uh, and then this thing constantly moved forward and back. Here the back is now facing the audience with the dancers in front, with the light only in front. And then uh, you can see that it then it actually, this was at city center, cantilevered out over the uh, orchestra, engaging them or, or denying them. Um, I do think, um, I think I, fell in love with many things that Billy brings to the table. What, one of them is, of course, her calm, her sense of, of propriety, her sense of taste and, and, uh, and uh, two-dimensional sense that I don't have color and so on. Um, but just because I fall in love with that in a way, I think I hold that as some hidden part of my, my world that, that she uh, powers up. And, and, and obviously, and, and I think probably the same is true with Billy, this 
this more typical architectural male sort of how does it, how is it constructed? What is the structure stuff? Uh, is something obviously that she then uh, helps to to calm and 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 create a kind of power, quiet power, or find quiet power, the abstraction within that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's uh, you know the balance of always the balance of opposites. I mean, I'm a very very big reader. Fiction is very important to me. So essentially, kind of linear sequence is how I see the world. It's a series of events. It's a series of places and it's linear. I go from one to another to another. I mean, of course, literature is not always like that, but I'm talking about sort of in a general way. I think um, that Todd is not particularly a linear person and is aware, is thinking three dimensionally, but it also means that um, progression is not necessarily his goal. No. His goal is understanding, but sort of moving forward uh, is not so important. Of course, right. it is important, but I think that that's how we sort of balance each other. Uh, I'm a little, yeah. So this is a, oh, I didn't know if you wanted to go on about that, but I was gonna. Please, please. We have to keep. So um, this was a, a project that we did. We met um, Isamu Noguchi in the studio in Long Island City. Um, wow. Of course, this is a very, very early image. So, um, but we then were asked to design uh, a traveling show of his Akari lanterns. This is the way they're normally displayed. And we had the idea of, well, I think it was, it was you or me, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But this is clearly a Billy image. These are both, the image on the right is by a, a terrific young artist named John Edwards. Edmonds. Evan, Edmonds, Edmonds, right, Edmonds. And then on the left is a dance by Tricia Brown. That is actually, yes, yeah, it is actually Tricia. So this whole idea of not revealing yourself um, is, is actually very important to me. And I think also very much um, about how our work unfolds. We don't really want to expose everything immediately um, we'd rather do it slowly and then this this idea of when she says we she means she not me I... <laughs> your favorite building is the pantheon so that's not a building that is exposing hey, itself okay, from okay, the okay, outside okay, okay, so you know trisha it. did this okay. piece called if you could see me and during the piece she doesn't turn around mm. and um john Edmonds has done a, a series of portraits of young men, young black men who choose not to necessarily turn around. And to me, they're both so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And also about a kind of how you can control power without necessarily. No, I think that's, I think that's true. And certainly something that can be learned. So uh, we, Akari means light. And so we felt that we should do something that related to light. And we also felt that it might be more, obviously, once again, it's a little like the screen can we interact with the, the basic subject, which is the, uh, the Akari lights. And so we created these two, these screens made of very, very thin fiberglass with a, a hinge detail that was quite simple. They were moved both to a kind of peach color and a, and a, a kind of sea, blue-green blue, blue color uh, with a little bit of dye and made in Long Island City by, or in a simple way, but it was very beautiful. Um, yeah, it actually was very beautiful. And it was actually worked quite well because they're fairly transportable, although the, the uh, yeah, they weren't, they're were imperfect castings. So through a series of screens, you controlled the-, the you Controlled of, the space, but also what you saw. Yeah, and, and in a way, uh, if you go back, I think it is correct that the image of the hidden lantern is Oops, as powerful as the- uh, as the one that's in the foreground. In other words, the, the sense of light beyond makes this both utilitarian, uh, it's after all a screen in a, in a space, uh, but it also is a light giver, much as Akari is. And again, as Billy says, it's kind of, and then here again, you see the, the trope maybe of the long table, in this case of gravel, with rocks in the garden, a little bit like Rionji in our fantasy. So and like, also like what we did at the, uh, well, domestic arrangements with a very, very long, long carpet. In fact, here we're, we're sitting at a table that's 20 feet long. 
uh, 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 about this project and domestic arrangements is that both of them were also made by hand, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's this element of, of craft and, and, uh, and the idea that your buildings are still made by hand that I think is very interesting. So yeah. as, as we proceed through the work, we can talk a little more about that. Yeah, I do think that um, certainly robotics exists, but I think it's always the people behind it. And, and the Folk Art Museum, we, this is obviously something that is, uh, folk art is something that is by work that is by untrained artists and sometimes people who are incarcerated and other times people who simply uh, didn't have contact with academia. Um, and it was tiny site. Um, the building no longer exists, but that was the site. Um, we just, we're really not going to show the project. Wide. But uh, again, this is another idea. Once again, the idea of withholding to expose. Now this was, one could criticize the building for being mute, um, but I actually believe that glass and dark glass can be as mute as a solid wall. Um, and then the issue of um, the sense of material that has been touched by hand. So, you know, we went out to um, Talich and the foundry and try to understand what the uh, fabrication process was. So that's Billy in the jeans and me in the shorts, actually doing some of the, trying to cast to understand ourselves. We're not artists, uh, but we or are fabricators. or fabricators. We're just trying to get understand a little bit what it means to be in the process. Can you tell us a little bit more about the materiality of the panels? Like, what are they? Right. Made? I mean, it's a much longer story, actually, that came from, uh, I, I won't even go to that. By the time we got into the idea of, of metal, Billy was wearing a, a bracelet. Well, I bought Billy a bracelet by Darcy Myro, who is a jeweler still working in. And uh, she had made the bracelet. She'd gone to Cranbrook and made the bracelet by chewing uh, wax and then casting it. Uh, and I thought that something that was, or we thought that something that was so visceral as that might be interesting and how large could we make it? We first tried aluminum and later began to experiment with uh, warmer metals. In this case, it's tombasil, which was, uh, we found out was a, a relatively quite inexpensive bronze that you could get in ingots that was used primarily for uh, fire hoses and stuff like and, and nozzles. And boat propellers, because yeah. the project architect, Matthew Baird, um, is very, grew up around boats. And so he said, well, this is, a, this is good for weather. And, um, and then we went to Talix and they were happy. We said, well, how do you, instead of a, a closed cast, which gives you a more precise definition, can we do an open cast? So the first thing we did was the metal up and poured on the floor of their foundries. The floor cracked, but the material came up in a very, very interesting way, like like a pancakes. And uh, so, really, we did spend time with it, them there, and that was that experimentation at Talix was super important. It's it's similar to slumping glass, for example. Yeah, exactly. The the problem, of course, is quite uncontrollable, particularly in larger areas. Mm -hmm. So in, in um, spirit with a sense of people making work that is not very polished or finished, I think the entire space was really conceived of as um, a place where one understood that certainly there was a sense of a kind of human connection. And we, and the, well, the art was also much more accessible. It was cluttered, just like we like the cluttered art here. Uh, <laughs> So this is one of the last images. Um, this was uh, the Taniguchi edition. edition the, and, um, Taniguchi was making that edition and then to obviously- the Museum of Modern Art. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, the, the weathering was uh, maybe a little disappointing uh, to me. It, 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 would, it actually needed cleaning in my opinion after a while. It was a kind of cool and warm uh, surface. What I think is is most successful about it, and and I'd like to know more from from your perspective is is how this building has a dialogue with its contents, right? So the facade is somehow um, inspired by, as you mentioned, work that feels less finished. And yeah. so, are you are you consciously thinking as you're developing concepts for a building? Um, 
and you mentioned the jewelry maker and you mentioned the dancer, all these people who are part of your community, um, mm -hmm. consciously thinking about how the architecture then has, is, is representational of its contents. Is that a, is that a reoccurring? We, we, we believe that and of the people who make it, but there's no quite, we also are interested in contrasts and because we're required to make some pretty technically exacting buildings, we have to assume that a good deal of the building will be uh, rigorously produced and, and technically produced. But somewhere we need to find that humanity. And the more we can do that, the better we think our buildings are. The, the humanity of natural, the natural order. Well, I mean, it's very much like a tr the traditional um, rug makers and then leaving a small sort of mark um, of imperfection. So you understand one with the presence of the other and you appreciate one with the presence of the other. Yeah. Can we pause for a moment on this image and, and talk a little bit about the demolition of the building? And I know that this is... Uh, I actually, I don't, the demolition I, I don't want to talk about it. Sorry. Okay. And, do you mind? I don't, Billy, do you want to talk about it? Well, we don't, okay, we don't we have, have... We haven't gone to MoMA since, I'm sorry. And, I, and it's a, and uh, they asked us whether we wanted to save the panels um, and or reuse the panels. And, I, and I, I wasn't able to even answer the question. And can you, can you tell us what year that was? It was 2013. So it lasted for about 12 years. Uh, and I'm, I don't... It's too complex a subject. I, 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 it's hard not to blame others, but it's hard not to blame myself. So, okay. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I always say that um, it, it's painful, but it's not your child. <laughs> yeah, we make it. Let's keep going. Okay. Thank you, you. I mean, given the public nature of your work and you're working on public, I mean, you're best known for public buildings. Yeah. Um, it is something about how you negotiate. I guess the question is, how do you negotiate that relationship to the client uh, and to the public and to each other in a sense at the same time, right? It's, I know it's a complex set of issues that you have to kind of navigate, but I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, is that, is that, top of mind when you're developing these public buildings? It's interesting because um, recently we had a meeting and the client representative said, um, you guys have to go in there as a united front. He was talking about the two of us, not just our whole team. He said, uh, because it drives our clients crazy when you go in and you disagree with each other. And I said, wow, you're asking us to change like 35 years years of behavior here. I don't know whether it's <laughs> been possible. It's the conversation and the dialogue between right. the two of us right. that is the way we um, go to the end point. And, and I, I've yeah. always said that Todd and I share the same destination, but we have totally different ways of thinking how we're going to get there. So, you know, they, you know, they just want us to agree, but I always see something bugs me and uh, I, I yeah, it's very he's, difficult, he's very difficult for me to be happy. Well, no, just unhappy because we're constantly trying to get to something that I, I, I'm not happy with, but, uh, but I know the directions where I want to go. Some, sure. So I think one of the reasons why it's been most useful for us to sort of work um, with a lot of nonprofits or within a kind of more a sort of art world context is because I think, rather, I think when people are used to having a discussion and a dialogue that is not necessarily the clear answer right away, um, they feel more comfortable with um, witnessing, you know, the sausage making. I think um, mm. when people are used to getting a, more clearly a product, and some of our clients yeah. in this particular nonprofit are actually well, usually the donors it, yeah, just donors want to are in, just get through it and give us the right well, answer. In the, in the develop, they're developers. And so well, they're more clearly used to kind of, mm -hmm. this is what it's going to be. And so it makes them feel insecure. Well, they're um, the people that make this. the money, usually. 
and, anyway. And, you know, I, and we're spending the money and, you know, that makes them nervous. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So probably speaking of a difficult person, this is um, Albert Barnes, who um, was the collector who put together the incredible um, Impressionist painting collection um, in Philadelphia. And he was a difficult person um, in many ways, I'm sure, a terrible and horrible client, but he, and he wasn't our client, but he um, believed very much in the importance of education. And he was very close friends with John Dewey, so mm. who believed that a democracy is strong um, through the education of its um, you know, citizens. And so this was the sort of ball. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Barnes and, and Dewey, uh, particularly as Barnes first looked at art, and this is The Postman by uh, Van Gogh, uh, it's one of the earliest collections. As Barnes went along, he increased his, uh, his range of interest in art to begin to include uh, hardware and conceive, belt believe that it could be art or, or uh, what things were, what pieces could have been anthropological before that, whether it's a Navajo blanket or uh, an African uh, artifact. Um, or medieval hardware. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, he had hired Paul Cray, and we can move through this. This is his collection and his way of hanging it. I think he was constantly also searching for the right way to hang it. And when we thought about the building and its exterior, we thought of something that was a little like a tapestry, uh, a, a, an African cloth. We actually you probably see one in the background here. We collect them. And, Barnes collected, and this is a kente cloth. Um, so we thought that it should be made of stone, but it should feel like a woven facade. Mm. So uh, this, of course, this makes me think of your work. Oh, thank you. This is about the, the rhythm of the facade and also about, in some way, a reflection of Barnes's uh, methodical means of hanging. Um, yeah, no, but, so go back too quick. I want to go back to the facade of the building. No, sorry, these are things we noted. Uh, no, oh, sorry, that, that's, a, that's our building. See the three lines and the sort of weaving. Let's go backwards. I'm back. to go back. <laughs> it's going Jesus. forward. I don't know why. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. We're, going, we're going forward really quickly now. Okay, well, Billy, you can use the arrows um, to go but, back. Uh, there there's we go. the voice of calm. Okay, okay. So the, you note this Paul Cray facade actually is quite a mute facade uh, with windows in it and it's neoclassical and centered. Uh, so the way we interpreted it was that the stones were not of consistent uh, coloration at that time. And I felt, or we felt that we could read a, th a tripart or a d several part type uh, sort of layering of this. So one so of the things we interpreted was that this felt like it was both neoclassical and in a way, a kind of wrapper. Right. Of stone. And the, then we saw this as another kind of wrapper as sure. the galleries wrapped. For the sake of the uh, conversation, can you just uh, quickly go over the brief for the project? Oh, so, uh, just... thank you. It's, um, there was a collection that Barnes put together and it was actually a house museum in Marion, Pennsylvania. Um, and over time, although it was his intention that this house museum would be open to many different kinds of people, because of its location, it wasn't near public transportation, and because the neighbors, because it was an increasingly wealthy area, weren't happy about having a lot of cars drive through, um, fewer and fewer people visited the collection, and it was very difficult to get into. So the the board of directors decided that they wanted to move it to downtown Philadelphia. There was a lot of um, pushback. Um, and one of Barnes's... Well, their logic was that it would be able to be more accessible to more people right. and that they could finally air condition it in, in the right way and find uh, perhaps collection storage and uh, have the more visitors than they could here too. And then um, in order to actually make the move, um, the directors had to go to court. And in the court case, the final result was the judge said the collection could be moved, but the hanging and the installation and needed the to remain the same. So that ensemble, the rooms, and needed the 22 to be rooms the same. needed to be in the same organization. 
So you move from room one to room two to so on. I don't know whether we're showing that here, but I'm mm -hmm. afraid we're going to. So that was the facade story. That's the facade. We're only really talking about the facade because there's so much of a story to tell here. Um, but here we can begin to see some of the stone, uh, the exterior stone that we used. And uh, that learning about the stone is a story it's in itself. So eventually we chose a stone from the Negev. Uh, we went to, the, went to Israel. We then went to the Negev and then to Palestine uh, where the stone was tooled and cut. Uh, and discussed with them what techniques were possible and found something that was had not been done before. Hmm. Uh, the original um, collection was in a garden. And so this, this idea of entering axially in the front from the center of uh, Philadelphia was important to us. And it goes back to this idea of not revealing yourself. So you walk around really to what is the kind of back of the building. And then you don't actually walk directly in, you walk towards the water and then you walk to the sides. So there's a whole sense of a kind of sequence of passage. And each area of passage is marked by something that hopefully has a memory or connection to what exists in the museum. So once again, it's an expression of what is in the collection. So since he collected textiles, this is a, a mosaic on the floor, which is based on a traditional weaving technique, um, which is called a liar's cloth. So Billy look at, look, took a drawing of a liar's cloth, sort of redrew it in her way on the left. And then we took it to people in Long Island City who could cut up the pieces of stone and, and uh, create that. So there's something about the kind of the legibility of the collection, um, not only being read as it was uh, sort of relocated, but then being read through the new structure that you're building. Yeah, exactly. Because this is now additional spaces that never occurred. It also has within it um, the original sort of box of paintings. So the box of paintings, the rooms within the box, with some exceptions have, has been reproduced you know, always sort of changed in terms of its detail, but reproduced um, in its new So we location. asked them to conceptualize this as an outside space, and that's why we said we should have stone on the inside of it, and it should get natural light in. So the, the box that Billy's referring to is there on the left. That's the reconstruction of the home, in a way, uh, so with the home gallery. Procession is from the outside in, and then once again to a, an interior space that makes you feel as if you're on the outside, right? Exactly, exactly. So there's a kind of lock. Those two people walking in have locked into the space. They then are on the outside, but still on the inside. And then they go, they have to go diagonally across the space and into the center of the galleries. Uh, so there are also study rooms, um, courtyards, but essentially the sense of the gallery um, has been retained. So we certainly kept the hanging, kept the proportions, um, lightened and changed the color and looked at all the details, but tried to both um, reproduce the spirit of the details. I think we're the final, oh shoot. Gosh, I know, we need to talk faster. We're... We've got two more projects. She's so are we, are we you told me that you- No, no, we're fine, we're fine. We, we, we've got, we can, we've got about 10 more, let's say 15 more minutes. I, I, it's, it's great to see the work and it's also great to see how um, there are certain themes that are carried forward, right, through your, through your oh, project. It's weird. It's weird. Um, yeah, one of them being the skylight, so I think we'll continue to, to talk about <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Prospect Park, um, Olmsted and Vox, and uh, this was uh, how they used the lake, which they actually created um, in the wintertime as well, this part of Prospect Park was, in fact, the more populous part of the park. So there was a lake to skate on, a lake to row on, a carriage concourse for people to stop, a, a concert grove, a music island. It was a little tacky, but uh, Olmsted and Vox, and particularly Olmsted, believed that these were refuges, ref, a refuge for people in the rapidly expanding industrial city uh, that were absolutely critical. I mean, parks are democratic space. So the more activities, the better. Unfortunately, all of those activities began to fail at some point. And in 1961, Robert Moses had them make a, a, a 
a rink and uh, turned the carriage concourse into a 300 car parking lot. Wow. So um, the rink filled in part of the lake in order to make that um, skating rink. And um, in our project, we work with Prospect Park to um, restore the lakeside, um, restore the island, and then to um, take what was a parking lot and turn it into two skating rinks. One, um, which is a kind of oval, which is for free skating, and the other one would be below a green roof, which is for um, ice hockey. Or in the summer, or play, or roller. And it's, uh, I mean, hmm? it's so functioning it's, year round, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it does mean the park is more active and, and the, all of the space, with the exception of going onto the space uh, for ice, uh, uh, or I guess the hockey rink uh, is free and open to the public. So uh, we've buried buildings that are, are there and our basic concept is a, is a floating plane. So it's a, once again, a kind of an abstract uh, seeming closure of, the, of, a, of a space, but then opening it up another way. We're very much in it not to feel like, but to feel like a series of walls that you pass through, which is kind of traditional way of moving around space in Olmsted and Vox um, Park. So we're using here a granite that's similar to the schist of um, Central Park and Prospect Park. And here you're walking between walls and you're walking next to a building which is actually buried under the earth. Right. Um, and then the ceiling well, well the, the conceit, the ceiling, uh, the, the whole canopy is held up by columns that are not at the corners and are not aligned um, so that it seems to float and thus the plane becomes a picture plane. And our idea was to take it from the marks of skaters, but if you look carefully, uh, we actually looked at a de Kooning, late de Kooning painting. Uh, and uh, said, yeah, figures in the, in the form. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the, that's the cheat. So the ceiling plane is in fact uh, a picture plane of the sky and, and those carved sections in the, in the plane are actually not lights at all, but they're just silver paint. Uh, kind of the whole thing is a bit of a, uh, you can't get so close to it. So the lights are both lined in lines. You can see over this child's head that they're in a line for even illumination and then for uneven illumination. Is, is there a reference there to um, to the night sky at all, to uh, Grand Central? Absolutely, absolutely yeah. Stephen, and we've done, I'm sorry to say that we've done that before uh, in different ways too. So um, you can see I'm here. Please to say, I don't care. It's just it's just that we return to these themes as, as a, I mean, well, we, maybe we can not do it the next time around. So um, it's also, water play in the summertime. And you can see the umbrellas on the top show you that the earth has been brought over the top of the building. But it frames a view in a nice way. The final project is our presidential center, Philip Goldworth. I, I'd just like to, I mean, interject for a second to talk about this idea of reinvention. Um, I mean, I believe uh, last uh, Wednesday, my co-host uh, Glenn Adamson was in conversation with Helen Angurias and and, uh, and she said something like, you know, everything is based on something else. Everything is built on something else. So in order to kind of, uh, I guess, in a sense, be true to herself, she builds upon her previous work. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is one approach creatively, right? Like we don't have to always think about reinventing. And I wonder, are you, are you challenged by that? Are you, are you, are you consciously trying to kind of reinvent or are you comfortable building upon your other projects? Well, as long as we, uh, that's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm not particularly comfortable, but the truth is we must build on both our, back, our past work and actually on the shoulders of others who came before us. So there's no question about that. Um, so clearly we want to find an original answer and sometimes the original answer actually isn't one answer, but it's two answers. Like we're an answer to a, a typical male architect. That is, we're a couple. You know, in other words, so things by put together in a different way can produce a very, very unique result. Yeah, Absolutely. I would say that even um, people. I think we very actually. I think we very deeply rely on the on on the work of others. Of course, 
both immediately people in our studio, but also um, work of others in the past. I mean, one of the things that we'll talk about in the Obama Center is it's very much, he is very much determined to acknowledge the people on whose shoulders he stood and be there so that other people stand on his shoulders. So it's not about the past, but it's about how you create a future. And so one of the things that's interesting as we looked at the different presidential libraries is of course, they're very much about legacy and they're very much about enshrining, um, in fact, literally the papers of that particular time. Um, one of the things that's different about the presidential center is number one, there aren't that many, you know, it was a digital, it was the first digital presidency. So the idea of putting papers in bankers boxes and keeping them in the dark is a, doesn't exist anymore. And well, one of the things that president believes shouldn't be enshrined. Right. So he's a contradictory, he's also contradictory because he clearly has, is a monumental figure and exists as such both because they both believe in that aspect to the, and, and it's the way of ennobling people but it also doesn't want his life to be over through the presidency. And although he's been quiet, he's been really working very, very hard. Right. So, so this here, this image of the Johnson yeah. uh, library is, is the opposite, right? This is the yeah. traditional yeah. sort of vault of, of documentation. When we sent in our uh, qualifications for the work, we, this project, Which was these two words were very, very important. One is ennoble, the other is enable. And certainly we needed to make something that acknowledged the nobility of this moment in time and this person in time and what this represented. And at the same time, this word enable is very important because that's what his work was dedicated to, enabling other people from the earliest days when he was in Chicago organizing to really now, and that's the focus of the Presidential Center. Yeah. And, and we're, we then equated ennobling with storytelling. In other words, putting your fingers in front of the fire and, and telling a tall tale and in a way enlarging history. And then the other one is story making, which says that every person has a story to tell and every person uh, should have a voice. So that, and then making, uh, then we actually presented this as an idea that it would not be just be a landmark, a singularity, but it would be a plural. That is, it would be a campus. And so we came to the presentations talking about these as values. Without really so much a, you know, clear idea of what the thing was, but what are the, what are the values behind the thing? So the site is, um, in Jackson Park, you can see along Lake Michigan. Uh, yeah. And the two parks are connected, Washington Park, Jackson Park. Um, you're a Chicago guy. I am, uh, yeah, yeah. I grew up uh, not so far from uh, Michelle Obama's house. Oh, really? Well, uh, yeah, cool. my, gra my grandmother, my, my whole family from that part of the city. Uh, actually, it's just, that's a kind of nice, well, this is, I mean, the real South Side that everyone talks about is a little further South and West. But the fact is that this is largely, you know, it's Chicago expanding down here. It's a longer story about Olmsted and Vox and this park. And it's, well, in a way, we felt one of the tragedies of this park is that it has this six lane road going through it and said, uh, you know, if we're going to put the presidential center there, we've got to get rid of the road. We can turn it into a bike path or whatever, but cars have to leave the park. So one of the uh, big things is that the road will be taken out, the um, running track actually has been moved um, further south. And uh, we would like the Lefrac is we're bearing at least two or three of the buildings, a 450 car parking garage, uh, part of a structure which we call the library, and then the, another structure we call the forum, leaving basically an icon that is the museum tower and a plaza. Can you talk a little bit about your collaborators there? Are you responsible for landscape? Are no, you... not at all. That's Michael Van Valkenburg, who's yeah. done Brooklyn Bridge Park. And Michael is a, uh, and his team are incredibly powerful. And Michael is a, I would say, is extending the Olmsted legacy of making sure that parks are for people more than any other person we can imagine. Yeah. He's also a plant guy, which is what Olmsted was, what sometimes irks some people is there's 
too, too much activity in a park, but just go to Brooklyn Bridge Park and you'll see it's really for all people and, yeah. and amazing. And that's what uh, we hope this will be. This park today, when we were there, uh, when that's we first cool. started walking in the park, there might be two or three people in the entire 20 acres. But as we developed this building, we, we thought of it being a kind of a, a, a lantern. Uh, weirdly enough, because it's got a museum in it, there's not, no one wants the windows that we wanted. Uh, and of course, we believe in solidity and, uh, and, and form making that, that you can bring light into buildings without having them turn into glass. Uh, one of the things I think that the hands were doing, um, because there is a, a very low element to the uh, presidential center, which is the part that's covered with earth. Then there's the sort of iconic element. And the iconic element we really thought of as, you know, being cupped. Um, and, and being and, different people's hands. Yeah. And, and holding a sense of light. Um, and also um, many people's stories. Because one of the things that is very important about the, um, and Ralph Applebaum is doing the uh, installation design is that it needs to be about many people's stories. And in this tower, it is the many people's stories who led to the presidency. In all of the low buildings and the lower level, build, lower level, because we have a, um, both a ground level and a lower level, those are all about the ongoing stories. So it's like, you know, existing stories, stories of the future. I, I think it's time to open it up to questions, if you don't mind. Um, I know that we got a few here in the chat. Um, let me just see. Um, here we have the opportunity for um, the audience to ask the questions directly. So uh, I believe the first one uh, from Peter Karzatsky. Uh, Peter, are you still with us? Would you like to ask the question directly? Uh, Peter wants to know, um, for many, the word craft has very specific meaning, often placing the practice in a secondary role to traditional visual art and architecture. Can you share your notion of craft and the role it plays within your work? So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of a big question. <laughs> we we, we probably answer it differently, but I, I mean, first, I think every person who builds something with care and love is a craftsman. That's where I, I, I go. Um, and they know the material better than anyone else. We had a, we know a fisherman who's, <laughs> who happens to be an oysterman and, and to hear him talk about the craft of oystering to me is to talk about the craft of art and life. So uh, that's where I stand. Uh... I think if there's anything, oh, there's so many things that this particular time is teaching us. Um, it is to think about what is really of value. Um, and, you know, what are the, what lasts, what, what really counts. So is probably style is not one of those things that is of value but the ability to do something really well and is of value. And so where does that sit within a hierarchy that has been sort of determined by people who may not be so much in charge of things? Because I think we are all much more in charge of how we value things. I think that's a kind of going to be a shift. Well, yeah. It's a big question, as you say. I mean, nothing lasts. I mean, we not, we don't last, and and our buildings do go down, and our cra the beautiful objects we make, many of them don't last too. So I think it's sort of uh, believing in the enduring, even though it's our our lives are ephemeral. And it's something about the representation of ideas, right? That yeah, that the ideas endure uh, beyond. Yeah. Yeah. But the idea and the ideas are passed on as we've, uh, and, and everyone has the ability to grab, seize the idea and uh, make it theirs. I also think that there's, um, we understand how um, actual true service um, is very noble. Mm -hmm. And we're recognizing 
the service of more different kinds of people. So mm -hmm. craft is also, I think, intertwined with this idea of service, and um, that's valued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't. Uh, we uh, we believe that everyone has is an artist. I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I believe everyone's capable of design, yeah. and so architecture and service of the public um, is is what we'd like to thank you for. <laughs> All right, Todd and Billy, thank you so much. Um, this has been uh, an incredible hour spent with you. And uh, obviously, I look forward to, to many more. Jennifer Luce, hi. <laughs> I see her name. Uh, probably others that I can't see. Uh, thank you so much for yeah, thanks, um, Stephen. inviting yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I'm sorry we talked too long, but no, 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 you were great. You're great. I really appreciated all of it. All right, you guys. Um, coming up uh, on Wednesday, let me see. Lucy, can you tell me who <laughs> who Glenn will be speaking to on Wednesday? Uh, April Grindman. Okay, fantastic. So please um, join us on next Wednesday. When my co-host Glenn Adamson will be in conversation with April Grindman, uh, graphic designer. Um, extraordinaire. Okay, you guys, this has been Design and Dialogue. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>